Good evening, Art History 2 class. I hope you're doing fantastically well. Greetings from London, and this is actually Shakespeare's Globe Theater, or at least the reconstruction of it. Um, today we'll be talking about Shakespeare, English Renaissance, and how that leads us a little bit into the beginning of the English um, uh, Baroque period that's slightly after the English Renaissance. Um, today we will actually be looking at the Globe Theater, be looking at some performances, and be talking about theater in general. So I hope you enjoy the show. minimize myself a little bit. Here's the beautiful view over Big Ben right here and the Parliament building including Westminster Abbey which is right behind here where you can see the Gothic spire actually coming up. This is the view from across the Thames, one of the most beautiful parts of London and we will be talking about um, the Northern Renaissance and Shakespeare as I mentioned which again goes from about 1350 to 1550. Note Shakespeare lives right slightly in the aftermath of the Renaissance, still considered um, an early Renaissance or a Renaissance artist, but he, um, along with the Northern Renaissance, goes a little bit later, sometimes in 1550, depending upon where you are. And London actually really contained, continues on into the Renaissance period, all the way till closer to about 1600, which is during many of Shakespeare's most prolific years. Where in the world is England, if you don't know? England is part of what's called the United Kingdom which is basically Ireland and Wales and Scotland and the United Kingdom all up here. This main area, this island, it, no, no, it is separated from the, um, um, the European um, line because you have the English Channel, which actually separates a very choppy piece of water from France. So France and England have been at war for many uh, centuries. London is right here on the map, as you can see. So it's in the south um, eastern corner of England or of the United Kingdom in general, and Stratford upon Avon, which is not that large a town, is right here, and that is really where Shakespeare is born. Shakespeare lives when he's not in London, where his family still lives. The same ideas that we had earlier from Erasmus are going to hold into the Northern Renaissance um, of England as well. That change from medieval mindset of a God-centered universe to a human-centered universe, of which Shakespeare absolutely looks at the human-centeredness of the world. A belief in empiricism, the study of human experiences is truthful and how we actually experience scientifically the world. And finally, humanism, humankind is God's highest creation and worthy of respect. That line that I'm actually hiding here within the process. Shakespeare is going to be at the forefront of this. So much so that there is a lot of controversy around Shakespeare's life. Many people saying, how could someone know so much about the human condition um, and so it has led many scholars, which we'll talk about in a moment, to question whether he actually wrote all of his plays and all of the poems, if it's a series of individuals that are writing them. He's also been claimed to be gay because he knows women so well, and he actually knows how women fawn and fall in love, and only a gay individual from this time period would know that. He was just very intuitive in terms of the human experience, a genius. The house on the right is Shakespeare's birthplace, that is in Stratford upon Avon in England, and you can go there and you can say, you know, the house are all a tutor from the song um, from Something's Rotten. And here's an illustrated work life, basically then, of William Shakespeare from the time he is born, going all the way to his work actually in his later life when he lives in England, lives in and works in London. Now, there is a Shakespeare authority or authorship controversy, and it comes down to the fact that who is the real Shakespeare? There are a number of individuals that say Shakespeare, it's just too much variation in history, in style, in poetic license, in different styles of writing, um, whether it's actually a sonnet, um, what, you know, written iambic pentameter or dactylic hexameter, don't worry about those right now. There are a bunch of different controversies out there, but generally the most people within the um, authorship community that are scholars of of Shakespeare, which I am not, so I have to rely on their work, basically say, absolutely, it was one genius man who was able to kind of create a new way of looking at the world, both historically through the idea of love marriage, um, as well as through kind of some of the haunting features that we see in Macbeth and Hamlet. The place where most of Shakespeare's plays are created um, and actually shown is a place called the Globe Theater. It's where I am right now. 
you will note there's basically three main levels. And right now, as you can see, I'm right in front of the stage. So I'd be at this area, which is standing room only at the very bottom. Ironically, these are where the poorest of the poor people go. And this is actually called, basically referred to as, excuse me, the pit. This is where the groundlings, the poorest of the poor, because the higher up you go, particularly in this middle section here, you have a much better sight line and view right above the stage. And then we have people in the middle class that are going to be up here. And so as you go up, except for that first range all the way on the bottom, which is kind of like where the mosh pit today would be in a concert, um, but it's always standing, you can't see, um, sit. So the closer you get to the stage, the better your view is. We'll talk about a couple implications that show up. Now for the groundlings and the way that the Globe Theater is set up, there are gonna be balconies that overview and give you a good view of both the gallery here as well as the stage. And so the main area that's taking place is called the Tyree House. So this is where you might put costumes. No one sits here. This is part of the overhang of the stage. Note, if it does rain, the groundlings get wet and almost everyone else is, is protected in this circular theater. The stage is right here. You can see it juts out and the groundlings get to stay right here. A groundling ticket is basically the equivalent of a penny. So almost anyone can afford to go to Shakespearean theater. It's pretty remarkable. The quote they have about the groundlings is the following. May you perform so well that the groundlings slobber on the stage. May you slip in it and break a leg. And that is one of the ways that people say where that phrase comes from. There are a few other, but this is kind of my favorite one. We don't have any historical proof of any of the theories, but this is the one that's passed down for the last couple of hundred years. Um, you'll see heaven all the way at the top. If you want to show hell, that's going to be down here by where the groundlings in the front of the stage. And our earthly realm then would be anywhere in here, including up in the gallery as it shows up. In Shakespeare's time, a couple of things that are very different than today. There was no lighting except the sun. So these were daytime performances and daytime performances only. <clears throat> the actors would wear street clothes. They would wear their clothes of the day. There wasn't a costume department. Um, there wasn't you know, a lighting department. They really would actually have to wear just what they had. Now, if they had better clothes and they were playing a higher class person, they'd wear those better clothes. There are very limited settings. I showed you, we have earth, heaven, kind of the ground level that shows up. So the play themselves have to provide all the languages. That's why Shakespeare, after he gives you an initial take on what's going to happen, he'll start off with in fair Verona, so you know you're in Verona, Italy. And then they will give you the actual, oh, it's in August today, because you can't see any of that other stuff because there's limited settings and the street clothes are not there. Women as still are not allowed on stage. Coming all the way out of the ancient Greek period, women are not allowed on stage. So even here, the, the part of Juliet would often be played by a young man who hadn't reached puberty, so he could have a high falsetto voice. Very similar to the way that Monty Python often handles their skits in English comedy today. Now, when we look at the Shakespearean and Elizabethan theater, one of the things that pops up is that there are a lot of impacts that we have today on our movie theaters and our movie snacks. Think about how crazy it is when you go to the movie theater. You might pay $12 for popcorn and a soda at a movie theater. In fact, Today, it might even be $16 for a large pop and a large popcorn. And they say, oh, by all means, get a free refill. But it's like they give you a tub. And the actual cost of making it is very little. And the reason why, partly, is Shakespeare and his fellow actors and directors. And that is because if you look at movie products, they have the highest markup of any products on Earth, basically, that are legal. So the markup on popcorn and pop in a movie theater is 1,275%. It costs somewhere about 37 cents to make a popcorn or to make a pop. And most of that actually, it's not the popcorn, the actual material or the pop, it's the bucket costs more than anything else. Look at the other things that have markups like this. When we look over here, cocaine has a 955% markup. The pop markup is 1,150%. It's higher than illegal street cocaine. The markup for guns is 1,022% markup for guns that are gun run. And for human trafficking, when we sell people, the markup is 895%, basically from what you paid initially. And yet for popcorn, pop, and nicey, that markup is somewhere. There we go. All right. So theater then has the snacks, have the highest markup of any legal product in the world. 
This largely comes out of the idea during the Elizabethan age, and particularly, it's been attributed to Shakespeare, but we cannot confirm because we don't have historical records for it, that he is the one who did not believe he was making a good enough salary for the miraculous artistic accomplishments he was doing. And so he once went to his director, the producer of the Globe Theater and said, I need a higher raised salary. I need a larger salary. I've got an expanding family. And I have this idea that we don't allow any outside food to come into the theater. We make them buy our own theater food and we can give them whatever markup that you think is fair. So they started selling three different types of food in an Elizabethan theater at the Globe Theater. The first thing they were gonna sell, you can see Mrs. Lovett's meat pies, but meat pies from Sweeney Todd. Now, we don't know what was in those meat pies, but we will tell you there were rats, cats, and dogs all over London, except in the theater district. So when you ate a meat pie, you very well, well might be eating dog, cat, rat, any animal that they possibly could find. They didn't sell that many meat pies. The next one up, an orange. An orange was a new commodity. It was different color, it was a beautiful shape. It had a fragrant, also when you eat it, you can eat an orange almost silently so you don't bother anyone else around you. So that was basically the snack food. That was their raisinettes or their chocolate bar, that sweet sugary sensation that comes up. The one that outsold everything else by far is a tomato. And that is because back then that they believed tomatoes, and they are a member of the nightshade family, and the only other edible form of the nightshade family, which I don't like anyway, so maybe it's not edible, is the eggplant. The nightshade family, otherwise, for those of you that know um, Halloween movies and Christmas movies like The Nightmare Before Christmas, Tim Burton, Sally feeds the lovely doctor nightshade to make him pass out, because nightshade is actually a, a, a drug that can kill you in enough doses. So it was considered as a poisonous thing. They didn't eat the tomatoes. We weren't making tomato sauce yet. That's a later innovation because tomatoes had just come over from the new world. So we are going to wait till they get nice and mushy. We're gonna sell them and we're gonna throw them at the actors. If we throw enough rotten tomatoes at the actors that it stops the show, we all get our money back. And from historical accounts, the one thing we do know is that not one time during any of Shakespeare's performances did they throw rotten tomatoes at him. He got fresh tomatoes, like you can see with that film that I got to help out on a number of years ago, Black Panther. And so I'm an Africanist, and so often I get to work on some of these films with Disney, and we'll talk more about that in the future. But the idea of this theatrical production really blowing up the stage. And the reason Shakespeare probably has, never has any is he starts off his theatrical productions the way that we do. He starts with juicy bits. He starts with fights. He starts with violence. He starts off with um, love stories and romantics kind of falling in love rather than building up the character to lead you to that. He basically does what a movie does today. He gives you the headlines, he gives you the most important ideas, he gives you some titillating fact or some violence to kind of calm, calm you at the very beginning to get you excited. Then he rolls you into the plot and the narrative. Now, one of the things that we want to talk about as we're talking about Shakespeare, and also now that we are into a couple weeks in the semester, a few of you are unfortunately starting to fall behind within the course. And the problem, of course, with that is the longer we wait to get you on track, the more likely it is that you are going to struggle with lower grades or potentially even fail. So this week's kind of lesson that we want to do on the video in terms of making yourself a, a better student from College Info Geek in the video you'll be watching is on the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro makes perfect sense because we were just talking about throwing rotten tomatoes and the Pomodoro, of course, is a tomato. So what causes your procrastination? Here's a number of things that cause procrastination. A lot of it is social media obsession, um, lack of focus, could be exhaustion from not sleeping, could be the idea of perfectionism and you're worried about even starting. This is what mine was in college. Start off with typical distractions that show up, could be work, doesn't have to always have to be social media, could be just fear of not doing well. So let's walk through a technique to try to get you through and over the hump if you are currently struggling with this in my or any other class. And this works no matter how you train your mind. Once you start doing the Pomodoro technique, it's very easy to start. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to identify the task. You're basically going to set a timer for 25 minutes, and you're going to tell yourself, no matter what, I'm going to remove all distractions, and you start off with the Pomodoro technique with everything off. And so if you are worried about your cell phone going off, you put it away, you turn it off, 
you could wait the extra 25 minutes to put it away for Instagram, for Twitter. You are not allowed to check that. You've got to put it away, put it in a different room, put it in the freezer so you can't hear it. Wherever you want to put it, just put it away. Then you sit there for 25 minutes with one simple task. What is it that you need to accomplish in the 25 minutes? Do you need to read five pages? Do you do need to um, start to write a paper? Do you just start to do research? Whatever it is. So let's say for the first three or four minutes, you just can't get focused. What do you do? You still sit there. You train your body because eventually your body will actually kick in. So even if that first time you do it, you don't do anything for 25 minutes, you take a quick break, you come back and you start the exact same process again. But no, without social media around you, no Facebook, no internet, no Twitter. And after the first 25 minutes, you decide, do I need to give myself a break because I was productive? I take a five or 10 minute break and come back and continue working on until I finish that project. Or alternatively, um, did, was I not that productive and I feel like I'm really getting going? Most of the time, what we find with the Pomodoro technique is that once you force yourself to get going and stop the interruptions, your body eventually kicks in and said, well, I'm going to do it anyway, so I might as well continue on within the process. And the maximum we ever tell anyone to take um, between breaks within the process um, is 15 to 30 minutes because otherwise you basically your brain is being retrained so to start all over again and so you come back and you're like, I forgot what I was saying so this is called the Pomodoro technique I highly recommend it but the key is you've got to put yourself in a situation with the right um, avenue that you have all of the materials and where you're not going to be distracted within the process now as we kind of get rid of our rotten tomatoes and move things out of the way I want to talk about a, a fun game and in class we'll play a game where we stand up if you said any of these words or used any of these words in language in the last 24 hours look at the words that are here these are all shakespearean invented words or shakespearean words that he uses that people weren't commonly uses and so he makes them common words and they're words that we use all the time today you look bet mimic flawed elbow hey we don't use hobnob that much backing hurry milk torture, um, academy, addiction, negotiate, monumental, vaulting, puking, undress, bandit, marketable, birthplace, courtship, um, circumstance, bedroom, everyone uses bedroom. The word film is also his. Um, and ironically, one of his most famous words that I love is actually the word swagger. So if you like, oh, so is obscene and arouse. The idea is um, if you actually, speak English to anyone, you are probably using some Shakespeare words um, or some Shakespeare words that I literally get piloted on that someone else invented, but he popularized within the canon. And you can look in the dictionary, there's some, somewhere between 422 and 1700 words that he invents or popularizes. And look at this, this is just insane when we look at it. Things we say today, which we owe to Shakespeare. These are all Shakespearean phrases. Knock, knock, who's there? Shakespearean phrase. Heart of gold, Shakespearean phrase. Set your teeth on edge, faint-hearted, so-so, good riddance, fight fire with fire, too much of a good thing, send him packing, wear your heart on your sleeve, not slap one wink, the game is up, full circle, um, fair and foul play, makes your hair stand on end, a brave new world, dead as a doornail, uh, vanish into thin air, out of the jaws of death, love is blind, a test that's a piece of cake. And you'll note how difficult it must have been during the time period where they were inventing the printing press. This is actually William Shakespeare's own handwriting. So you can notice he didn't have, to study, have the best penmanship. He was studying it, it appears to be more of a doctor than an author based upon his penmanship. So if we look at the phrase creation, this was actually from Engel from 2002. It's pretty awesome. Here's, if you've used any of these in the last 24 hours, you basically have been speaking Shakespeare. If you've ever been footloose or fancy free, if you've ever thanked someone from the bottom of your heart, if you've ever been left high and dry, if you ever take a, take, took a test that you thought was a piece of cake, if you've ever refused to budge an inch, if you've ever been tongue-tied, a tower of strength, a pillar of virtue, hoodwinked or in a pickle, if you've ever insisted on fair play, slept not one wink, stood on ceremony, or had too much of a good thing, if you ever believe the game is up, if you ever lie low till the crack of dawn, through thick and thin, because you suspect foul play. If you've ever been on edge without rhyme or reason, if you wish I were as dead as a doornail, well, first off, that's not very nice. If you think I was an eyesore, a laughing stock, 
a stony hearted villain, a blithering idiot. It's Greek to you for you are quoting Shakespeare. So all of those are Shakespearean. So it's so common in terms of the way. One of the questions comes up, of course, then is how did anyone know what this man was saying at any given time? Part of it is gonna be context. There was a lot fewer words back then when he lived about one quarter of the words we currently have. And so there were not nearly the same number of ways to express yourself. And so uh, English was a way, uh, was easier as was all languages to kind of be able to impact the world at large. In fact, Shakespeare has had a larger impact on anyone in human history, on any language, except perhaps for one. And he still may, may be number one. Anyone have, who had, and have any idea who that other individual who might have had a bigger impact than Shakespeare? Number 422 words to 1700 with all these different phrases on language than Shakespeare did on the English language. It's not Jesus. That's always the first one that comes up. It's not Homer. The only other person that's even in his league is Confucius with Chinese. So we could play Shakespeare bingo with all the words. You know, instead of a doornail, all those, we could just pull them out like bingo. That's how many different phrases. When you could play key, you could even play Uno cards. There's more than 52 words, so you could actually have a deck of cards with all of Shakespeare's phrases and still be able to play with a deck of cards. How did they know what he was saying then, besides the limited number of words in the language at the time? Well, we are starting to invent and actually create the Gutenberg printing press by the time Shakespeare's come along. There are a number of printing presses available in London, and so it changes the way that people read. They just don't have to go to a play. They could potentially buy a printed version of the play now and act it out themselves or read at a later time period if they couldn't make it to um, the show. It's also a way that people in other languages that in other areas, because they could translate the language over, might not actually be able to see or hear or understand it in English, but puke is such a good word for understanding the sound and what that is. It's very visceral about the action of throwing up. And so words like that, or bedroom. Bedroom is just better than everything else. Before this, they called it a nuptial chamber, the idea of a place where you would put a bed when you fell in love. Now you actually have a separate bedroom itself. And so some of these words are just better. Walking around, man, you've got the swagger. That is also a Shakespearean word. Before this, books would be made in a medieval scriptorium. And it would take two years to make one Bible. Now with the Gutenberg printing press, in two months, you can make 1,000 Bibles. So basically, anyone of any means, except for the very poorest of the poor, can own a Bible, and those Bibles were be given out free by the church. One of the things I want to emphasize within this class, particularly when you go off to your junior year, is go to study abroad. Um, here's a map of the plays of Shakespeare, even though he was not very well traveled himself, spending his entire life in England, never even crossing the channel to go to France once, which is today by car only an hour and a half away. A future hint all the way at the bottom. When we look at CEOs of the top 500 Fortune 500 companies, they are all well read and they are all well traveled. The average CEO will read 30 books per year. They are constantly absorbing and thinking about new information, new ways of doing things, new product lines, where the world's going, different cultures and how they're doing it to bring it back to their company. So well-traveled and well-read people have way more opportunities because they have way more experience of what's out there in the world, even if they didn't necessarily see it on its own. So for all of you, oh, I would highly recommend traveling your junior year abroad. And I don't think Ellen's going to come on and greet us today. But this is an artwork that changed the world. And it's Romeo and Juliet. And here we had Ellen introducing us, basically just keep educating yourself, just keep educating yourself, but it's not here. So I'll have to refix that. So just what? Just keep oh, there. making art. Just keep making art. Hello, friend. Oh, I will forgot what I was supposed to do. Thank you, Ellen. Um, my mistake. Ellen was there. Um, but it's the, um, the idea of just keep making art. And that's what Shakespeare did. Keep making these plays, keep making these sonnets. And so what he's going to do is popularize a concept that's called love, marriage, and Romeo and Juliet. Before this, almost all marriages are arranged marriages. They were a family with a father and another family with a father and a daughter and a son are going to put those two together so that the two families come together and bond and it unites the families together in a political economic arrangement. These two people probably did not love each other. 
they may have never even seen each other before. And that's how arranged marriages work. Well, this is great, except the man that's marrying the woman, the man is often 35 and the woman might be 16 or 17 because it's a matter of joining a guild and a man has to have somewhere between 15 and $20,000 in order to join a guild. And most of you, let's face it, at 20, don't have that kind of money laying around. And once you develop it and raise that money, you're gonna be much older than the people that you are going to marry that are of marriageable and childbearing age. So there's a lot of widows as well, because if you're 20 years older, the man is probably going to die before the woman. And then what does the woman do? Will she be taken care of by her children? That is completely up to her sons to actually figure out how they're going to care for a mom if they do decide to care. Otherwise her husband uh, or other side, her brother actually could inherit her and Lily Harrington's, not in a sexual relationship, but in order to be able to take care of her. And so this was something that women were reacting against. And so we have to ask, which is better arranged or love marriages? So let's look at the science. In love marriage, when we survey people, we are about 38% happy. About 46% are satisfied, which is still a terrible number. And there's a divorce rate where we say we can't even do it anymore for 43% of individuals. So it comes down to the science of love. When you first meet someone and you are actually all excited, your primitive brain very much kicks on. And you're gonna have this overflowing love. If you have in a relationship now for the first, say six weeks of the relationship, sometimes you are my worst students. You're my worst students because you can't get into Frazier's class. You can't get into art history, why? Because you're always, oh, he or she, they're so dreamy, I can't wait to have a day to, what are we going to do? Your head is just filled with all sorts of different cocktails of neurotransmitters that academics are generally not your number one thing, right? Your limbic system, your libido, it all kicks in and you're thinking about being with that individual. After six weeks to about three months, whew, you settle down. And so between three months and about three years, you literally are falling in love with that individual. And as you fall into love, these are often my best students. These are the people that can stay up all night, talking with an individual, finding about cuddling, nestling, you've got bonding, but you're also very activated to make yourself better. And so you often do really well academically. At the end of three years, if you're still in the relationship, this becomes the marriage cycle. When you hit about three years, you set in as well. And your brain, rather than producing these overwhelming bonding chemical, produces a chemical for long range, kind of the love hormone down here, oxytocin. Three years is about when we get married. You chemically are different when you first met this person. When you first met this person, you were excited, you couldn't wait, and you were overwhelmed. Three, six months, or six weeks to three months, all the way up to three years then, you were having the cuddle and the romantic feelings. You can't wait, you can't know. And then you hit flat line. Of it. You feel love, but you don't need to be with that person every moment of every day. In fact, that person might even annoy you in some point if you're with them like in a, a corona situation where you're locked up with them day after day after day after day. You still love them, but man, tiny little things that you used to overlook, you might not be able to look over. That's when you actually get married. And then you add the stressors of kids and jobs on top of that, which you probably did not have before or to the same extent. And now, man, we have a lot of divorce rate. When we look at arranged marriage, they do it differently. Arranged marriages, and yes, they can get divorced, and these are actual numbers. They are 78% happy. They are 88% satisfied, and the divorce rate is 8%, and they are allowed to get, these are arranged marriages where they're allowed to get divorced. Why? Because your parents love you. They love you more than anyone. Some of them, they'll love you more than yourself. They would do almost anything. Many of them would actually give their own lives to protect you. So what do they do? They are going to find someone who matches up, not with physically, not with the emotionality. Yes, they want you to be attracted to the person. They want you to share life values with that individual. Are you, do you have the same economic interests, right? Are you both go-getters? Do you both want to have children? Are you both of the same religion? Do you both have basically the same background or social underpinning? Those things that can actually challenge you would make a, for um, a much more stable marriage, a stable marriage for the children as well. 
And that's why when you look at love marriages, 38% versus 78, you'll note they're roughly 40% off in every category. Arranged marriages are just better. They are. Scientifically, they're better. And yet, love marriage is the one that we're promoting today. Love marriage comes out of Romeo and Juliet, and it basically tells this woman who's about 16, she might even be as young as 14, that, wow, your life in the future, you're going to get married to a much older man. You are going to have an arranged marriage that your father sets up. You're probably not going to find the person that you marry attractive. They will be able to financially support you and the child, or children, um, until they die, particularly if you give birth to sons. But what woman at 14, 15, 16, that's the life that she's thinking about, right? She's got different chemicals. These are the same people, same evolutionary species. They're going to be going through puberty at the same rate, having those kind of sexual, erotic kind of feelings that are going on. And yet, basically, from a male patriarchal cult culture, we were literally suppressing that as much as we possibly could. And so love marriage, once William Shakespeare shows it in, in um, Romeo and Juliet, look at all the popular cultural references, whether it's a terrible movie, Twilight series, and the eclipse, Romeo versus Juliet. We have Romeo and Juliet here, or the variations of Shakespeare in love and Romeo and Juliet. Women see an out. Rather than being a 35-year-old guy, maybe I can find a guy that I'm attracted to that's actually maybe fairly wealthy or in the same class, and I could run off with that individual. This happens so often that later on, the entire government of Europe, um, and specifically in England, they're going to shut down Elizabethan theater because too many women were running off with men. And it was breaking down the social fabric of how families used to join together. So they shut down Elizabethan theater really in response to Romeo and Juliet. Now, the balcony scene is probably the most famous scene that I want you to know from Romeo and Juliet is the four pages that I asked you to read. And we're going to go over three main passages here. Because remember, this is a 14, 15, 16 year old girl who has had one and a half dances with this boy that she's head over heels with. He clearly feels the same way about her too. And he's just a few years older. Both of them come from wealthy families. And so it should be a marriage, hopefully, that the parents could work out. But remember, these parents, the Montagues and the Catholics, they hate each other. They're sworn enemies. And so what happens is after the dance is over, after this party that um, Romeo is not supposed to be at, he kind of sneaks in in disguise. He decides he's actually going to go to Juliet's house. He is going to jump over her fence. And then he is basically going to wait outside her window while she gets dressed and then comes out, hopefully for a gander at the moon. He has basically become a stalker. We would call this stalking. We would call the police today if this happened. And Juliet, when she comes out without knowing Romeo is there, so this is important, she basically says the following. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name, or if thou wilt not, but be sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. She's basically proposing marriage here to an open air. And of course, Romeo feels this. He sees this. He's infatuated with this girl. And so he knows on some of how she feels if he can interpret this. Guys, a woman says this, deny thy father, refuse thy name. Do you think Romeo as a 16, 17, 18-year-old boy is going to have any clue what he says? Of course not. Because men, we just don't get it. Here's Paul Rudd, very much Ant-Man. We're emotional dunderheads. We just don't get the emotion that shows up. So Juliet, Romeo announces that he's there. And Juliet is going to tell him how she feels now that she's there. Remember, this is a stalker in some capacity. She's up on the balcony, so he's still below. And Juliet says this. And you think Romeo is going to get this being at the last passage. Juliet, thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. Else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek for that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Fain would I dwell on form. Fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell, compliment. Dost thou love me? I know thou will say I, and will take thy word. Yet if thou swearest thou mayst prove us false at lovers' perjuries. They say Jove laughs. O oh, gentle Romeo, if thou dost love me, 
pronounce it faithfully. Or if thou thinkest I am too quickly one, I'll frown and be reverse, and say thee nay, so thou wilt woo, but else not for the world. In truth, fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou mayest think my behavior light. That is the word being invented here, behavior. So he's going to invent the word behavior it's being invented right here with the explanation. Any reason why Romeo is going to pick this up? Know and follow through on what you say. Of course he's not, because men are emotional dunderheads, as I said. And according to this, I don't always know what I'm doing, but when I do, I'm clueless. In the emotional romantic world, that is absolutely true. There are many, 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 many times, many times, and I've been happily married for 25 years, where my wife will say something and she expects that I pick up on whatever language she is using. And later on, she said, well, I told you, I said, no, you did it. She said, well, I said this. And I said, no, you didn't. You said this. She said, well, of course, we've been married 25 years. So you should know what that means. So we still have that. Um, I am an emotional dunderhead as well. I'm a man. I don't get it. And so the third time, Julia's like, all right, the night is coming down. If my father's guards find him, they're going to kill him. He's on our property, right? So we got to make sure that I get this and that you understand this from me because you ain't getting it. So Juliet is going to be very, very, very forthful. Remember, and forthright. Remember, this is a 14, 15, 16-year-old girl talking merely 500 years ago. And when she's doing it, she is basically pronouncing love and marriage to Romeo, who's just not getting it. Remember, Romeo has options. He's a wealthy individual. He can marry anyone. He can actually bring the family, but then he would have no choice as well, or very limited choice. So Juliet says, three words, dear Romeo, and good night indeed. And of course, those three words, ladies, are, I love you. Good. If that thy bent of love be honorable, thy purpose, marriage, Send me word tomorrow by one, basically by one o'clock, that I'll procure to thee where and what time thou wilt performest the right. And to all of my fortunes at thy foot I'll lay and follow thee, my Lord, throughout the world. This cannot be any more clear, even for emotional dunderheads like myself and for Romeo that shows up here, or for Paul Rudd that I showed you before. Three words I love you. And note, if you love me, you want to get married, tell me tomorrow what time and where will I be, and I will come and get married to you. This is about as direct as you possibly can get, and it does put the challenge out. In 500 years later, later ladies, how many of you would still feel comfortable, or feel comfortable today asking a man to marry you? Because that's what Juliet is doing, because her opportunities are terrible. So he agrees to it, but the consequences, of course, are disastrous. Now, the other thing that Shakespeare is known for are his sonnets. And here is one of his sonnets, probably his most famous one, sonnet number 18, another famous one, sonnet number 20, which I had you read. And it basically is a citing, a sonnet is a 14-line poem where there are two four-line poems called a quatrain that generally rhyme with A, B, A, B, being the first line is A, the second line is B. That means the third line, A, B, A, has to rhyme with the first line. Second line has to rhyme with the um, first line. And at the very end, we're going to have a couplet that shows up. It can be on any topic and on any subject. Now, there's been many, much speculation that because Shakespeare wrote so prolifically in so many, um, but there are some problems with a few of them from the modern day perspective. Again, a modern day perspective. And that is, some are dedicated to women, and others are dedicated to men. My dark lord, my fair maiden, and part of the reason why people have actually speculated that Shakespeare might be gay, homosexual, bisexual, because some of the, the lovely poetry that he writes are dedicated to a, a, a dark lord or a wonderful man. And one of the things that shows up is that this is simply not the case. We have to look at it from a Renaissance perspective. Remember, he is a professional writer. Wealthy women who were not very good at writing or not very confident would come to him to write love poetry to their husbands. And that's why we get the image of things such as my dark lord. There is no 
historical indication at all that Shakespeare is gay. None. He's married. He has children. He goes home. Now, he might be an absentee father because he lives in London. His family lives in Stratford-upon-Avon for most of their lives. ...of any homosexuality, bisexuality at all. That's the only evidence that we have. So let's read the first couple, the first four lines. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So what can we come from? What can we actually analyze and get here? What is he comparing? All right, so he's looking at female beauty. All right, the virile nature coming out of a long winter. He's looking at the, the beautiful nature of a woman who is young, kind of that budding post puberty. She actually looks absolutely beautiful. She's temperate, she's mild, she's kind of well made out, gorgeous. And yet her beauty is going to have too short a date. It's not gonna last forever. It's not gonna last forever. Note the next couplet, or the next, I'm sorry, quatrain. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shine, talking about the sun or of her beauty. And often is his gold complexion dim, and every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing untrue. Again, the idea of that fading beauty over time. This seems a little bit less romantic, right? You are absolutely stunning and beautiful and gorgeous and virile, and wow, I would love to be with you. But I do know that your beauty is going to fade. Now, if you look at the next one, so we're eight lines in now, by chance or nature's changing untrimmed, by thy eternal summer shall not fade. Again, he's coming back. You are always going to be this beautiful. So it might not just be outer beauty, it could be inner beauty. Nor lose possession of that, the fair, that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wantest any shade, when eternal lines to thine thou growest. And then lastly, the couplet that goes along with it. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So if you look at this, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, and note, he's referring to the line before. When in eternal lines do time thou growest. Eternal lines. He's talking about the poem. That this woman's beauty will live on forever. Even after she fades, as the summer goes, as she gets old, and as she dies. Why? Because I've immortalized how beautiful you were for anyone who ever can read and actually picture and imagine what the beauty of you is. So your love is now eternal. Eternal. Thanks to me. And that's what he's looking at. So it's self-congratulatory in terms of creating an, an image about beauty that is really an homage to the beauty that you have and will always have, and I will always see you in this capacity. So a very romantic poem. And we do not know he, who he wrote this for. Now, as we look at this, I want to show you an epic rap battle. You probably know this. So William Shakespeare versus Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss! 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 Dr.
you do. Yes, you rap fast and true. Now let's see how you rap or sing what I do. Oh, 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 oh. No, no, you and so one of the things I would like you to do um, as we wrap up is challenge, create a top 10 list of why we actually care about Shakespeare. If you can come up with this, then you really do have a good idea about Shakespeare. And I'll let you pause this while I move on, talk a little bit more about the rest of the English Renaissance. The other aspect or the other artist we want to talk about during the English Renaissance is a portrait painter. And his name appears Hans Holbein. You'll see he's actually before Shakespeare from 1497 to 1503. So in portraiture, all of the things we talked about with Erasmus, that middle class portrait uh, uh, patronage all the way up to the idea of the God centered to a human centered universe, the empiricism getting all the details. The Erasmus image that we looked at at the very beginning of the course where we talked about Northern Renaissance, that is actually done by Holbein himself. And so Henry VIII, the most famous portrait of Henry VIII, it's also done by him. The Thomas More, who was executed by Henry VIII for not supporting the English in church, that's also his. And the Catherine of Aragon. Now, what's interesting about Hans Holbein is um, portraiture was often used when kings wanted to get married, but there was no Twitter, there's no Snapchat. So what would you do? You would send your court painter to see the woman that you were going to marry and get a good likeness of what that woman would actually look like. So you would decide if that woman was attractive enough for you, particularly if in your upper class. And there's a story then about Hans Holbein where he once did a lovely image of a girl, but made her look more beautiful. And Henry had a problem with that. So that's actually what's going to show up in this particular Smithsonian Channel 6. There is actually a Broadway musical that's coming that's actually called Six that is based upon the six wives of Henry VIII, six or seven wives. And the most famous artwork then by Hans Holbein is the ambassadors. Again, we do have portraits that show up, and it's famous for a new unusual feature called anamorphic perspective. Here you see the skull, and here you see the, the, like the, the reminder of death from the skull. But no, that's the skull. You only see it when you go outside of the room. So when you're looking at the picture, it basically just looks like this odd figure, this odd image that shows up on the carpet beneath it. And yet when you go to leave the room, then everything else is out of proportion and the skull now comes in proportion, almost as a symbol that death is about to happen. And so above, you see the timekeeping, the navigation, you see the various scientific instruments. Down here, you're gonna see the worldly arts. So timekeeping, navigation, the celestial book. Down here, you have the world globe. No, you have Martin Luther's psalm book underneath the loot. Martin Luther, remember, it's the individual that is actually going to um, eventually help break apart the Roman Catholic Church from the Anglican Church and the Protestants. Um, up here, you have a crucifix. No, very much hidden out of the way. And you have all this religious dress that's taking place over here. And so versus secular dress. So we really do see a separation between kind of church and state and the death as you're walking out in a very odd picture from the Renaissance, but a beautifully crafted artwork that shows up. And I think lastly, we have a parody of Henry VIII and Holbein if it happened in the modern day world. I need a clever idea on how to promote my latest film. Ah. As if Henry VIII had a cell phone. This has actually become a website then where Henry VIII tells you about different aspects of English history that you can actually follow. So with, this was their announcement for that particular um, show on YouTube. The two different calories they were arguing over at the time. They were going to use the Julian or Gregorian calendar. Why do all artists think they're so clever? 
And so this is a show that actually has a couple episodes. And so, as we think about the Northern Renaissance, try to create a top 10 list of the most important features of Northern Renaissance, where you include some of those features from um, Shakespeare going all the way back to um, the Jan van Eyck, talking about the Eisenheim altarpiece. You can talk about Grunewald um, with the crucifixion, any of those features that show up. You give a top 10 of the most important features of Northern Renaissance. And that will end our lecture for today. Have a wonderful day, and I hope everything is well. Bye. And bye from the Globe Theater. <laughs>